Ezekiel chapter 20, beginning at verse 1 and reading to verse 1. It came to pass in the seventh year, in the fifth month, on the tenth day of the month, that certain of the elders of Israel came to inquire of the Lord and sat before me. Now, it's interesting, even as we begin, let me lay a couple of things down for you. Ezekiel gives a precise date of when this takes place. According to the Jewish calendar, it's um, either the month of July or the month of August. The year is 591 B.C. And, and what we have here in verse 1 is the elders of Israel have come to Ezekiel in order that they might see if they can inquire of the Lord. Now, they'd come to him earlier. We already saw this in chapter 14. And at that time, Ezekiel had brought the Lord's rebuke because of their idolatry. So once again, these elders come and they're seated before him. And as they're seated there to inquire of the Lord, it says in verse 2, Then the word of the Lord came to me, saying, Son of man, speak to the elders of Israel. Say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Have you come to inquire of me? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abominations of their fathers. And so this time, as they come and are seated before him, Ezekiel is, is commanded by God to do something. He's to rehearse the history of Israel's rebellion against God. Now, these men are, are seated before him as if they're interested in what God has to say. But God is, is emphatically refusing to be inquired of by them. That's what it says in verse 3 when it says, Have you come to inquire of me as I live, says the Lord God? I will not be inquired of by you. They're seated before him as if they're interested in what God has to say. But God emphatically refuses to be inquired of by them because these people are not repentant. These people are insincere. And because they are unrepentant and insincere, God makes it clear, I'm not going to answer you. I'm not going to respond to you. Now, the psalmist in Psalm 66, verse 18 says, If I regard iniquity in my heart, the Lord will not hear. And that's what's taking place here. These people are unrepentant idolaters, acting as if they're interested in what God has to say. And God says, I will not respond to you. The prophet Isaiah in Isaiah 59 verse 2 says it this way, Your iniquities have separated you from your God. Your sins have hidden his face from you so that he will not hear. And so they're acting as if they're interested, but God says, you've come to inquire of me and you expect me to respond to you, but because your heart is far from me, because you don't desire the things that are, are pleasing to me, God says, I will not be inquired of by you. Notice verse 4 when it says, Will you judge them, son of man? Will you judge them? Then make known to them the abominations of their fathers. So instead of answering their questions, God actually commands Ezekiel to bring judgment. God is saying that, that Ezekiel is to set forth his case against them. And so in order to do so, what we'll see here in this chapter is Ezekiel is going to review their past history. And it's going to be presented to them factually just by reminding them of what they've been in the past through their ancestors. They're going to point to them that they have a long history of rebellion and idolatry. And so it's a word of judgment that he's going to bring to them. Verse 5, say to them, thus says the Lord God, on the day when I chose Israel and raised my hand in an oath to the descendants of the house of Jacob and made myself known to them in the land of Egypt, I raised my hand in an oath to them, saying, I am the Lord your God. On that day I raised my hand in an oath to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt into a land that I had searched out for them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands. Then I said to them, each of you, throw away the abominations which are before his eyes and, and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. But they rebelled against me and would not obey me. They did not all cast away the abominations which were before their eyes, nor did they forsake the idols of Egypt. Then I said, I will pour out my fury on them and fulfill my anger against them in the midst of the land of Egypt. But I acted for my name's sake. 
that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles among whom they were, in whose sight I had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. And what he does is he begins first by reminding them that he had a covenantal relationship with the nation of Israel. That's what it means when he speaks concerning raising his hand. That's, that's a picture of a covenant that God had established with this nation. And so the first thing he brings up is that Israel rebelled against the Lord while in bondage there in Egypt. And, and while suffering in Egypt, God had provided deliverance for them through a man by the name of Moses. And, and God had said through Moses, I, I'm going to bring you into a land that is blessed, a, a promised land, a land that you can describe as, as flowing with milk and, and with honey. Uh, God in Exodus chapter 6 verse 8 says, I'll bring you into the land which I swore to give to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, and I will give it to you as a heritage. I am the Lord. And so from the beginning, God is pointing out to them that he has had a covenantal relationship with them, that he made a selection of that nation gave them special promises, and yet they remained in rebellion almost consistently, almost constantly. You see, while in Egypt, the Jews had become idolaters. Notice in verse 7 how he says, I said to them, each of you throw away the abominations which are before his eyes and do not defile yourselves with the idols of Egypt. I'm the Lord your God. So while they were in Egypt, they actually defiled themselves. What they did is they saw something that, that caused the inclination of their heart to desire it. This was clearly revealed in their history. When Moses was receiving the law from God and how that, as Moses was receiving that law, his brother Aaron was approached by the children of Israel. They said, we don't know where this man Moses is. We need a God to go before us, like the gods we had served there in Egypt, and therefore, you need to make for us something we can see. You know the story, how that Aaron said, then bring all of your gold to me. They melted it down, made a golden calf, and the people rose up the Scripture says, to play. Immediately what they did is they went right into idolatry. It was all that they knew. It was what they were familiar with, and it's what they desired. It was something they had learned in Egypt, and they didn't want to turn away from it. They saw the beauty of what they considered to be that form of worship and didn't want to worship the invisible God. Moses is gone. As far as we know, he's abandoned us. Why shouldn't we? do what we've done in the past. And that's why they began to worship that and dance before that golden calf. You remember the story. It's almost humorous if it weren't so tragic how that when Moses comes and sees what they're doing, he asks Aaron, what are you doing? And Aaron's response is, well, you know, the people, their heart is bent towards rebellion. He says, we threw some gold into a fire and this calf popped out. So he didn't even take the responsibility for what he had done. And so God begins from the very beginning. You see that in the book of Exodus, by the way, chapter 32, verses 1 through 14. They wouldn't even take the responsibility of, of their sinfulness, and so God is, is bringing that up to them. And so what is the result? Well, in verse 9, he says, I, I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles among whom they were in whose side I had made myself known to them to bring them out of the land of Egypt. I, I wanted to, to make sure that my name was not defiled. These Egyptians saw through those ten plagues God deliver that nation, and yet that the, the nation returns to the things that they had been washed from. So God says, listen, I acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles. So the basis of his mercy is his name's sake. He does this, in other words, for his own glory. That's what he's saying. You see, God's name is intended to communicate God's nature and all that he is and all that he has revealed. It's interesting, again in the book of Exodus, how that on one occasion Moses, who was very, very intimate in his communication with God, how that Moses made a request of the Lord. He said to him, and you know this request, he said to him, show me your glory. Remember how Moses said that to God? He said, show me your glory. And God says to Moses, I can't. No one can see my glory in its full essence 
and, uh, and survive. There's no way that I can do that. And yet, God does give to him a picture of his glory, and it's found in, in the book of Exodus in chapter 34. And it's interesting how the Bible says that God takes Moses and, and places him in the cleft of a rock and, and basically covers him up and then passes before him so that he can see that residual effect of God's passing by and see some of the evidence of his glory, but he never really sees God's full essence because he couldn't, had he seen the essence, he would die. But it's interesting how it says in Exodus 34, verses 6 through 8, the Lord passed before him and proclaimed, the Lord, the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abounding in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children and the children's children to the third and fourth generation. Moses made haste and bowed his head toward the earth and worshiped. When God revealed his glory to Moses, even though the residual effects of seeing his essence as he had passed by and had left that, if you will, for him to be able to see a physical manifestation, when God wanted him to know his glory, it's interesting that the way that he revealed his glory to him is by giving to him his name, because his name reveals his attributes, and his name is what is intended to, to awaken them to the reality of what God's nature really is all about. And so, he says, I acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles. Well, in verse 10, continuing, therefore, I made them go out of the land of Egypt, and brought them into the wilderness. And I gave them my statutes and showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me, that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them, and they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness to consume them, but I acted for my name's sake, that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. So I also raised my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands, because... They despised my judgments and did not walk in my statutes, but profaned my Sabbaths. For their heart went after their idols. Nevertheless, my eyes spared them from destruction. I did not make an end of them in the wilderness. So he moves from their early history there in Egyptian bondage and takes them to a second stage, and that is their rebellion in that wilderness. Now, when they had rebelled against him, God exiled him in the wilderness for 40 years. And, and, and once again, he's making it clear that this rebellious nation had great opportunities to do that which was right. Notice how he says, I gave you my statutes, I showed you my judgments, I gave you my Sabbaths. In other words, by, by his goodness, God had given them his law, and he gave them the Sabbath in order that they might be blessed. Now, when he speaks of giving them the Sabbaths, that's the, the weekly Sabbath. It was intended to give a preview of, of the rest that they would have in him because on the seventh day, they were to rest and they would get an, an insight into what it's going to be like in their fellowship with God where they cease from all labor and simply rest in him. Now, those Sabbaths were specifically given to the nation of Israel. According to Exodus 31, 16, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant. The Sabbath is, is for the, the Jewish nation. But as God is speaking to them, and I want to highlight this and spend a moment looking at this, he makes a strong point, and I want you to see it in verse 13. Notice how he says, if a man does, he shall live by them. If a man does them, he shall live by them. Obedience, obedience to the commandments was a requirement for them to have a relationship with him, to be saved. Now, the fact is, nobody can completely keep the law. That's the whole problem with it. There's a variety of reasons that the law was given, 
One of those reasons is to expose us to our inability to keep it. Because even as the Apostle Paul states, he says, you know, I didn't know that I had certain sins until, until the law was given and then all kinds of lust awakened in my heart. And what happened is he's simply saying is the law gave a name to the nature that I have. So the law, when you're looking at the law, a lot of times we think of the law of God and perhaps some of you may not be aware of this and therefore I'll say it very quickly. You might be thinking, the law, what is that? And so the natural inclination for most people is to think in terms of, well, the Ten Commandments. Is that what the law is? And obviously, in the law of Moses, there are the Ten Commandments. But when you begin to study the Old Testament, you actually find that there are some, some uh, 613 commandments that are specifically given that if you do these, you shall live by. 613 commandments specifically given to the nation of Israel. It wasn't just Ten Commandments. Ten Commandments alone are enough. But when you go through the Old Testament, you look in the law, you find that there were actually 613. There were ritual laws and a variety of other kinds. And so the law was intended to awaken in, to, in us a, a, an awareness that, that there's something wrong with me. There's something in wrong, wrong with me. Like Paul would say, the one who wants to do right has, a, has, a, has the, uh, the constant battle because I, I, I do what, what is wrong. And he even went so far as to say, uh, who's going to deliver me from this body of death? The will is present. The ability to perform that which I desire is not. Oh, wretched man that I am. I wonder how many in this room understand that. I think most of us do. I, I want to do right, but I don't have the power to do it. Before I got saved, you know, I, I didn't want to hurt my mom, and I, and I didn't intentionally set out to, to cause my dad pain. I, I didn't want to. I didn't wake up in the morning and say, what new, you know, madness can I get into today that will result in hurting mom? I, I didn't do that. When I had girlfriends, I didn't wake up that morning and say, saying, what can I do to break her heart today? How can I lie to her today? How can I use her today? How can I? I didn't think that way. I, 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 I just did those things. They were natural to do because my propensity was to, to make sure that, that I was satisfied no matter what it may have, how it affected somebody else. As, as long as I'm doing okay, as long as I'm happy, I, I really didn't care whether you were or not. What does that matter to me? That's human nature. And, and, if, and if the person didn't like it, well, I'm sorry that you don't like it. I really am, and I'm sorry that it hurts you because I really don't want to hurt you. But you're going to have to live with it because I'm not changing for you. Why would I? And that was human nature. As a kid, tried to do good. Got tired of trying to do good. Finally decided to do what was natural. And what was natural was evil. And it was a lot easier to do the evil than it was to make decisions to do that was good, that which was good. I can still remember at the age of 18 and 19 years old, even into my 20th year, before I got saved, I can still remember, and many of you can identify with this kind of sentiment, getting so tired of being what I was, getting so tired of hurting people, so tired of the addictions and the out-of-control behavior and the insanity of it all, the craziness of it all, that I finally still remember saying to God, God, you got to help me. I just, I just can't take this anymore. I just can't. I've had it, Lord. I can remember that. The desire to do better was there. The ability to perform that which I desired was not. The law. No man is justified by the law. The law cannot justify you. No one can keep it perfectly. Jesus made it very clear when he was given the Sermon on the Mount. He said, adultery is, is not the act. It's the intent of the heart that you would perform that act if, if given the opportunity to and knowing that you could get away with it. You've already committed adultery in your heart. Murder is not simply getting up and killing that person. It's that anger and unforgiveness in your heart. It's that, that murderous intent within you 
that has already broken that command because the law is spiritual. It's not simply the, the physical actions. You see, the Pharisees, if you were to look at the religious leadership during the time of Christ, and, and you had this, this group of men related to in Scripture as the Pharisees, numbering around 6,000, very small in number, very great in influence. When you look at the Pharisees, they were the model of righteousness. When people saw them, they had these robes that were broader at the bottom there because they broadened those robes to give the, the uh, impression that they were more spiritual than others. They had the law that was in what is called a phylactery that was hung before their eyes in a little box with Scripture in it, and, and they had it before their eyes. And when people would see their phylacteries and see the broadened, uh, broadened robe, they would say, there goes a Pharisee. That one is so righteous. They would stand on street corners. We know this. We read our Bibles in the New Testament. They would pray so that people would see them. They had certain times during the day that they would pray, and they made sure that they were in an open sight so that people going by would say, look at that man praying. When they gave their gifts and they did so generously, it was also very ostentatious. They did it openly for, for attention's sake. They would do it to be seen by men. When they fasted, they would disfigure their faces and they would walk about looking so sad and so hungry so that the people would know, oh, indeed, these people are fasting, these people are praying, these people are giving. These are the people who would walk in and they'd take their coins and they'd throw it into these little trumpets there as you walked into the court there of the Gentiles and you would give to the poor and the, and the coins would rattle around in that little trumpet and make some noise and they were trumpeting their gifts. And Jesus said, they have received their reward. He saves his most scathing rebuke to the religious people. When you read Matthew 23, he goes so far as to call them hypocrites. You hypocrites, he said to the Pharisees. You go throughout the world to make one convert, and once you have converted him, you make him twice the child of hell that you yourself are. You strain at a camel, and you, you strain at a gnat and swallow a camel. He said, you tithe of the mint and the herbs and all manner of spices, but you forget the weightier things of the law, like love, justice, mercy. These are the things you ought to do, and you've left them undone. When Jesus would speak to the Pharisees, he spoke with some strong language. He didn't speak like that to the publicans. He didn't speak like that to the to the. Uh, to the uh, sinners. He, he spoke like that to the religious people because they had every outward aspect of being righteous. They spoke great swelling words. But he says, your hearts are far from me. Your hearts are far from me. You teach us doctrines of God, the commandments of men. Jesus said that. So the law, by the law, no one is justified. When Paul was writing in Galatians 3, verses 11 through 13, he said this. He said that no one is justified by the law in the sight of God is evident. For the just shall live by faith. Yet the law is not of faith. But the man who does them shall live by them. Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law having become a curse for us. For it is written, Cursed is everyone who hangs on a tree. Perfect obedience was never possible. Outward appearance was not sufficient. Again, if this were the case, the Pharisees were the greatest believers of their time, yet Jesus saved his scathing words for them, for they were hypocrites. A philosopher once said, When I talk... I put on a mask. When I act, I take it off. Talking is cheap. Talking is easy. There are so many. Without judgment, I hope this doesn't come off judgmentally. I'm not intending it to, but there are so many who can talk but don't walk. We, we can give some mighty sermons about love and caring and generosity and the need for prayer and, and we don't live those messages and that's what Jesus was saying. That's what Jesus is saying. See what happens guys is and this is what the Lord is saying. He said look I gave you my law. If a man does them he shall live. But 
it wasn't that just that outward obedience that he was talking about because in order for them to have real life, they, they needed God's Spirit. Remember in chapter 11 of Ezekiel and, and verses 19 and 20 how, how God had given this, this promise, I will give them one heart, I will put a new spirit within them, take the stony heart out of their flesh, give them a heart of flesh that, that they may walk in my statutes and keep my judgments and do them. They shall be my people. I will be their God. God had said, I'm going to give you the ability. I'm going to give you the power. I'm going to write my law on the tablet of your heart so that it's not the outward that you're, that you're obeying. It's the inward inclination of your heart that has been transformed because you're born again. In the New Testament, in John chapter 1, verse 17, it says, the law was given through Moses, but grace and truth came through Jesus Christ. In Galatians 3, 24, Paul said the law was our tutor to bring us to Christ that we might be justified by faith. The law was intended to awaken in me an awareness of a need for something greater than what I have. That's why I was able, that's why you were able to on that occasion, whenever it was, to say to God, be merciful to me, I'm a sinner, I need your help. So the promise that God gives is one of faith. When you have faith in the Lord, it, it, you know, we have, we have a, a time, and I was saying this recently in an interview um, on the radio, um, we live in a time when we trivialize the gospel and we make it into a bunch of sayings and we forget that. No, no what God wants me to have is, is not simply intellectual knowledge of things about the Bible, as interesting as it can be. What God wants me to have is love for him to love God with all of my heart not 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 just knowledge of scripture knowledge of the author knowing the author when I was in the army I would receive letters from home mama would write me Friends would write me. My sisters would write me. And uh, those letters were special because that was my family. But if I took that letter from mom and I handed it to a stranger, somebody who had never met my mom, doesn't know me, doesn't know my family, and I said, isn't this a great letter? They would look at me and say, doesn't pertain to me. Why do I care? I mean, it's nice that you get a letter. That's not for me. The Bible is a, a letter, but it's written to family members. That's one of the reasons why some people, when they're not saved, that's why they, they, they say, well, I tried to read it, it made no sense. Well, of course not. You're reading somebody else's mail. It wasn't written to you. It was written to those who are in love with God. And, and then when you fell in love with God, your eyes and your understanding were enlightened. And you start saying, this Jesus that I've just heard about, I have a relationship with. He, he's... You know, he's not some dead philosopher. He's alive. He's a living Savior, and I have a relationship with him. And, and it comes because I, I ask God to forgive me of my sins. I ask God to come into my life and to transform me. And, 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 and I've discovered that. The Bible says that I become the temple of the Spirit of God, and the Spirit of God dwells in me. And I'm now made alive by him. So it's not an intellectual faith at all. What it is is it has intellectual content, but it's a relational faith because I have a relationship with the living God. That doesn't come through the law, but the law makes it possible for me to come to faith in God because it reveals to me his requirements, and thus he can bless me through it as I turn to him in faith. So he says again in verse 11, I gave them my statutes, showed them my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them. Moreover, I also gave them my Sabbaths to be a sign between them and me that they might know that I am the Lord who sanctifies them. Yet the house of Israel rebelled against me in the wilderness. They did not walk in my statutes. They despised my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them, and they greatly defiled my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them in the wilderness, but I acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned before the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. So I also raised my hand in an oath to them in the wilderness that I would not bring them into the land which I had given them, flowing with milk and honey, the glory of all lands, because they despised my judgments, did not walk in my statutes, profaned my Sabbaths. Their heart went after their idols. Nevertheless, 
My eyes spared them from destruction. I did not make an end of them in the wilderness. Once again, God does this for his name's sake. Obviously, God's name means little to most people. God's name means little to most people. Turn on any television program, go to any movie, you know, that is not um, G-rated. God's name is thrown about as part of a plot. I mean, they have people just using his name in vain, Jesus' name in vain all the time, all the time. It's just a common thing. You can't say some words today in this politically correct society, but one of the words you can use is the name of God in vain. You can do that, and nobody gets in trouble for it. Nobody thinks a thing about it, but God says, I care about that. It's my name. I care about my name. Most people don't, but those who love him do. So what he's doing is he's acting to make sure his name is not dragged down by those who are identified with him. You see, his professed followers can make him look powerless to save because they don't live lives that reflect the power of God in salvation. They, they say, oh, I know God, but in reality their actions demonstrate that they don't. He says in verse 18, But I said to their children in the wilderness, Do not walk in the statutes of your fathers, nor observe their judgments, nor defile yourselves with their idols. I am the Lord your God. Walk in my statutes, keep my judgments, do them, hollow my Sabbaths, and there'll be a sign between me and you that you may know that I am the Lord your God, notwithstanding the, the children rebelled against me. They did not walk in my statutes, were not careful to observe my judgments, which if a man does, he shall live by them, but they profaned my Sabbaths. Then I said I would pour out my fury on them and, my, and fulfill my anger against them in the wilderness. Nevertheless, I withdrew my hand and acted for my name's sake that it should not be profaned in the sight of the Gentiles in whose sight I had brought them out. I warned their children not to be like their parents, he's saying here. But they disobeyed and ignored me. I warned them that I would bring judgment upon them, but they chose to rebel. So God said, I'm just going to wipe them out. It's an interesting thing when you read Numbers chapter 14. How God speaks to Moses there and he says, you know what I'm going to do, Moses? I'm going to wipe them out. I'm just tired of them. They've got on my last nerve. And I'm going to wipe them out. And I'll start all over with you. Now, what's significant, there's so many significant things about that conversation that God and Moses have. You have to remember the history of Moses. Briefly, Moses, Jewish baby, raised by Pharaoh's daughter, the age of 40, sees a, an Egyptian taskmaster abusing one of the Hebrew slaves, kills him. It's found out, goes into the wilderness, we're told in the New Testament that Moses supposed that in that action of deliverance, how he had taken the side of the Hebrew and had defended and actually killed the one who was harming him, that the people would know that he was to deliver them from bondage. He, he supposed that. He was wrong. He was turned in for doing that and ended up in the backside of the desert for 40 years, as you know. For 40 years. Now, in the first 40 years of his life, he thought he was somebody. The next 40 years of his life, he discovered he's nobody. Then the last portion of his life, he discovers what a nobody can become when that nobody is on God's side. That's what happened with Moses. Moses originally would have thought, great, yeah, kill them all and start over with me. Good plan. So when God says, I'm going to wipe them out and I'll start over with you, it's a real, real interesting insight in the way that he responds. Because in Numbers 14, verses 15 and 16, Moses says, 
If you kill these people as one man, the nations which have heard of your fame will speak, saying, Because the Lord was not able to bring this people to the land which you swore to give them. Therefore he killed them in the wilderness. And then in Numbers 14, 19, he goes on to say, Pardon the iniquity of this people, I pray, according to the greatness of your mercy, just as you have forgiven this people from Egypt even until now. God, for your own sake, for your own glory's sake, the people will say you could pull them out of, the, of, of, of slavery, but you can't deliver them to the, to the end. It's for your own glory. For your own glory, act with mercy. And God says in verse 22, uh, I didn't want my name profaned amongst the Gentiles, and so I didn't wipe them out. I wanted to demonstrate that I'm able to deliver and able to preserve this nation, so I didn't wipe them out. Going on into verse 23, Also I raised my hand in an oath to those in the wilderness that I would scatter them among the Gentiles and disperse them throughout the countries because they had not executed my judgments but had despised my statutes, profaned my Sabbaths, and their eyes were fixed on their father's idols. Again, Israel was in bondage in Babylon because they had never repented of their idolatry. Therefore, verse 25, I also gave them up to statutes that were not good, judgments by which they could not live, and I pronounced them unclean because of their ritual gifts and that they caused all their firstborn to pass through the fire that I might make them desolate and that they might know that I am the Lord." So, as he's continuing speaking of the rebellion, he brings it to the present. And he's saying, listen, you guys have been entangled even in recent history in statutes that are not good. When he speaks of these statutes that were not good, that's, that's relating to pagan worship, the Moloch worship. And he's saying, I allowed you to defile yourself. I allowed you to practice these rites. But... I am also judging you because of it. I let you do these things, but it's going to be the cause of your judgment. In, in Psalm 81, 12, God says, I gave them over to their own stubborn heart to walk in their own counsels. And so they're taking what God had given to them, their children and their produce, and they were sacrificing it to idols. And God says, and that's what I'm going to do. I'll judge you. Verse 27, therefore, son of man, speak to the house of Israel. Say to them, thus says the Lord God, in this too your fathers have blasphemed me by being unfaithful to me. When I brought them into the land concerning which I had raised my hand in an oath to give them, and they saw all the high hills and all the thick trees, there they offered their sacrifice and provoked me with their offerings. There they also sent up their sweet aroma and poured out their drink offerings. Then I said to them, What is this high place to which you go? Its name is called Bama to this day. Bama means high place. It's actually Bama. Therefore, Say to the house of Israel, Thus says the Lord God, Are you defiling yourselves in the manner of your fathers, committing harlotry according to their abominations? For when you offer your gifts and make your sons pass through the fire, child sacrifice, you defile yourselves with all your idols, even to this day. So shall I be inquired of by you, O house of Israel? As I live, says the Lord God, I will not be inquired of by you. What you have in your mind shall never be when you say, we will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries, serving wood and stone. In spite of God showing grace repeatedly, they didn't obey him. They continue blaspheming, they continue being unfaithful, and yet God brought them faithfully into the land of promise. They continued practicing their idolatry. They worshiped the spirits in the trees. That's what it's speaking of in verse 28. On these high hills, they practiced the worship of a goddess named Asherah. She was the Assyrian goddess of fertility and love, and, love, and she was worshiped through sexual rites. A trunk, a tree trunk represented where she lived. It was her, her temple. And the thing that God is saying here is nothing has changed from the beginning. You have consistently rebelled throughout your history. So you're asking, should I allow you to approach me? And my answer is, no, I won't allow it. Isaiah in chapter 1, verses 11 through 15 says this, To what purpose is the multitude of your sacrifices to me, says the Lord? 
I have had enough of burnt offerings of rams and the fat of fed cattle. I do not delight in the blood of bulls or of lambs or goats. When you come to appear before me, who has required this from your hand to trample my courts? Bring no more futile sacrifices. Incense is an abomination to me. The new moon Sabbaths, calling of assemblies, I cannot endure iniquity and the sacred meeting. Your new moons and your appointed feasts, my soul hates. They're a trouble to me. I'm weary of bearing them. When you spread out your hands, I will hide my eyes from you. Even though you make many prayers, I will not hear. Your hands are full of blood. You see, their belief that God will allow them to approach him while they're in idolatry isn't right. And he makes it clear, you're in sin, and yet you want me to give you direction. And I won't. In conclusion, and by making application, this is one of those reasons in the New Testament sense, this is one of those reasons why it's important to love God and remain faithful to Him. It's that desire for, fa for a constant and consistent relationship with Him. You see in verse 32, notice what they're saying. We will be like the Gentiles, like the families in other countries serving wood and stone. Their desire is to be like the world around them, and they don't want to be different. And today, Christians need to remember that we don't imitate the philosophy of the world or the ways of the world. I've said this many times, and, and I say it because it, it, it needs to be said. Sometimes I, I, I think it's because well, I was this way. When I was young, I used to look at an older person and I'd say, well, it's easy for you to say. You're so old, what can you do sinfully? You're too old to sin. You know, you, you, you come to church, you give a Bible study, you go home and eat some yogurt and go to sleep. I mean, that's your life. <laughs> There's no sinner like an old sinner. Sometimes people will see older saints and wonder how they got that way. You don't get uptight about a lot of things. You don't get overly stressed about a lot of things. They'll see you and they'll say, you carry a lot of weight. You've gone through a lot of pain. You've seen a lot of hurt. But you don't fold. You don't give up. You don't lose heart. You, you don't respond with anger when, when I definitely would respond with anger, and yet you don't respond with anger. You, you turn the other cheek. You, you walk away. You, what is it with you anyway? Is it because you're too old to fight anymore? Is it because you got tired of fighting? What is it? Why don't you have that aggressive spirit? Why don't you do the things that the world does? Why, why don't you? Did you lose your savor of life? Do you think that life is boring? Are you just passing through it so you can die? I mean, what's going on with you? My kids, for the longest time, didn't understand my life. And over the years, on many occasions, as they grew up, they would ask questions of me. How can we do that, Dad, and why don't you do this? They never understood. And the answer is very simply this. I have a real belief that I'm just passing through. This world is not my home. There's something waiting for me on the other side that's a lot greater than anything I can experience here. Heaven is real. There are treasures there that I'm laying up so that when I get there, they're waiting for me. What matters is not what I can acquire here on earth. That doesn't matter because you can work as hard as you can and gain as much as you can. Like they used to say, the man, you know, who collects the most toys wins. No, the man who collects the most toys, when he dies, he loses it all. You don't take anything with you. The only thing that, that lasts is, is a relationship with God, and it's the only thing that matters. 
Everything else is behind that. That's why God says, love me with all of your heart, with all of your soul, with everything within you. Fall in love with me. Why should I love you with everything that's within me? Because that's how much I loved you. That's how I love you. See, a lot of times people think, why should I love God with everything within me? Why should I give everything to him? Because he's already done that for me. That's why. Marie's pregnant with our firstborn. And as a soon-to-be dad, I, I put my hand on that, that belly of my beautiful wife, and I, and I feel the kick, and I get thrilled because I can feel life a life that Marie and I created together. It's quite a thrill. And as I put my hand on that little belly, and as the belly continues to swell until it's time to give birth, I used to put my face against Marie's stomach there, and I would yell, Hey, baby! This is Daddy! Seriously, this is Daddy! Can you hear me? Wake up! And I would yell this. I would yell, I love you. I love you. I did it all the time. I'd put my face next to Marie, and I'd say, I don't know if this kid can hear me or not, but I'm already in love with her or him. And I would do that like a lot of dads do. I loved that baby. I loved that baby before that baby parted the womb. I loved that baby long before that doctor handed me that ugly little thing called Corinne. <laughs> Ugliest baby in the nursery, but it was mine. I loved her. Marie went through 33 hours of labor to give birth to that baby. And for her, every moment was worth it. And that baby was born. That baby was loved. That baby was loved long before that baby had seen the light of day. That baby was loved before I held that baby in my hands. That baby was loved long before it could even focus her little eyes. That baby was loved from the moment that baby became my baby. She got older and then one day said, you don't love me. You don't love me, Daddy. Oh, are you kidding me? I don't like you very much, <laughs> but I sure love you. And I told her that. I loved you when you were in Mama's womb. I loved you when you parted that womb. I loved you when they handed you to me. I've loved you from the moment I knew you were there. And I love you now. And... My little girl says to me, Daddy, I love you. And in my mind, I think, you love me because I first loved you. That's how it works. We love him because he first loved us. And he loved us even when we didn't even know he was there. He loved us when we were so angry and hurt and mad and wondering, how come we got such a raw deal in life? He loved us so much, he sent his son to show us the depth of his love. He loved us so much it hurt when he died on that cross. My sin made a separation. God says he's going to pay a penalty that's eternal. I need to do something to bridge the gap between us and he sent his son to do that. With one hand, he took my hand. And with the other hand, Jesus took his father's hand. And he joined us together through him. No, God isn't going to let us get away. 
No, he said, I'm not going to allow you to be like the other countries. No, I'm not going to be allowing you to become idolaters like the Gentiles. No, that'll never happen. That's not my plan for you. The Bible tells us, come out from among them, be separate, saith the Lord. Do not touch what is unclean, and I will receive you. Come out and come to me. That's what you do when you come to Christ. You say, God, forgive me, a sinner. I have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in action. But I need your mercy and your forgiveness because I want my life to be changed. I've tried to be good. I can't be. I've gotten so bad, people think I can't be saved. But I need your help. Lord, would you touch my life? And God says, yes. There's no sin that's so great that I can't forgive it. There's nothing you've done that is so bad that I can't heal you from it. But you need to come to me. And if you do, I will not cast you out.